So we'll start with the esophageal core three today. We're going to go over benign diseases of the esophagus, which uh, we covered in the last several lectures, last two lectures that included some strictures, some gastroesophageal reflux complications, and things like that. We're going to go over some benign tumors, which you will see very few of in your career. They make up about 1% of esophageal masses. We'll review them for completeness sake, and we'll review the top three, as I will do for the uh, esophageal operations, which I'll review the top two, which 98% of these procedures in the, on the esophagus are done in this fashion. We'll go over esophageal cancer. That'll take up a lot of our uh, discussion today, uh, in, in which include uh, the uh, demographics of the disease in addition to staging, which is always asked, and not just on uh, general thoracic boards, but also the general surgery boards. Uh, it's staged very much like uh, colon cancer because it, uh, it shows the, uh, the generation of the walls of the esophagus and where exactly it attacks. And then we'll go over esophageal resection. And I'll give you <clears throat> the pros and cons of blunt esophageal resection, transhiatal. Then uh, my favorite, the Ira Lewis, because I have big hands. People that have size seven and a half and eight can't get their hands through the posterior mediastinum. So I use a, a Ira Lewis. I did use a transhiatal for a while until I got into the trachea a couple of times, so we will proceed. Blyomyoma is the most common benign tumor in the esophagus. This is something you need to remember because it's always on the board. It, it's, uh, patients present usually asymptomatic or with dysphagia. It's in the smooth muscle uh, layer, so it's a smooth muscle tumor. You do not have to violate the mucosa or do a, a, a segmental resection for this tumor. It's usually done through the scope where you just basically go through the adventitia of the esophagus and shell this out and check for mucosal tears thereafter. Uh, stromal tumors are rare in the esophagus. Granular cell tumors are relatively common, and those are usually picked up by your gastroenterologist and are locally excised, so you never see those in surgery, but just for completeness sake. Cysts are very common. Esophageal duplication cysts are cysts that lie right along the esophagus that you see in asymptomatic patients who had CT scans for other reasons and they come to you with a posterior mediastinal mass to differentiate a neoplasm such as lymphoma or a neurogenic tumor in the posterior mediastinum. I see these quite often. They're called esophageal duplication cysts. Lipomas, hemangiomas, pancreatic arrest are, are uncommon. Once again, this shows uh, the, the three most common types, lyomyoma, duplication cyst, um, and uh, polyps are the three most common. So lyomyoma, forget, don't forget that. I'll show you a slide here in a second. Esophageal polyps are relatively rare. Those are also excised just like uh, endoscopically per oral with a snare and usually some kind of electrocautery. And the only time you'll see those is a complication of a GI procedure. And the third, uh, third most common uh, uh, is uh, a benign esophageal mass, it's esophageal duplication cyst. <clears throat> so it's usually attached to the esophagus, it's in the posterior mediastinum. Uh, Microscopically, it has two layers of muscularis propria, and it has epithelium consistent with GI tract. It does not communicate with the esophagus, so you won't see this endoscopically through, through EGD. This is what endoscopically the uh, lyomyoma look like. It's a benign appearing, uh, just a bump in the road, so to speak. Something you see, it can ulcerate, but very rare. Uh, when we see those, uh, they're beautiful, they're great cases. And we can do a minimally invasive. You get in there and all you have to do is pop it out. It's almost like uh, the olive in the pyloromyotomy. It's very similar, same type of tumor. This is what, it, what you see by uh, barium esophagography in the upper left-hand corner. Right here you see an indentation which is relatively smooth. Surprisingly, these things can become very massive and patients are relatively asymptomatic because the contralateral wall will allow dilatation uh, and it, for food to, boluses to pass through. It shows uh, the mass in the posterior mediastinum. This is where I usually see these patients to say, okay, is this lymphoma? Do you want to do cervical mediastinoscopy? Yeah. Endoscopic ultrasound is really something that you guys are going to have on your test. Uh, and basically, all you have to do is look at this. It's pretty simple. If you see something smooth and echo-free, it almost always is a benign lesion. It could be an intramural hematoma. Uh, those that are solid uh, and uh, have variegated insides usually are cancer and they're usually serrated on the outside so the, the uh, endoscopic ultrasound is important here's the smooth once again lining from lyomyoma and this is what it looks like it's a small <coughs> it's a homogeneous tumor microscopically this is just a a out pocketing uh, epiprenic diverticulum that you'll see it looks like it 
piranha, actually, if you look at it from bronchoscopically, but this is an EGD. It shows an epiphrenic diverticulum. The two types of diverticuli in the esophagus, pulsion and traction. Traction means that these, the lymph nodes around the esophagus actually pull. It can actually pull the diverticulum outside the esophagus. And a pulsion is a pressure, which usually means you have a, some sort of a, a myogenic problem with the muscle with um, some sort of motility issue in the esophagus itself. This is a, a polyp at the distal esophagus. It uh, can be excised endoscopically, usually with the snare and some electric cautery. You never see these. These are benign, and they usually are associated with gastric polyps. Anybody know what this is? Starts with a Z? Okay, Zankers. Uh, I reviewed this a couple of weeks ago, or a couple of weeks ago, yeah. This is a pulsion diverticulum. It's usually above the cricopharyngeus, usually because of some uh, issues with esophageal motility. Uh, we normally see those after ENT or someone has tried a poor per oral uh, treatment of this or they've tried to tack it up and have not resected it. So the, these things are not as easy as you think. If you think you could go through a left neck incision, go to the cricoid cartilage, that is the, the discriminator between the, the pharyngeal constrictors and the true cervical esophagus. So remember that cricoid cartilage. It's below that is the uh, cervical esophagus. Above that is pharyngeal constrictors. That's ENT territory is what I, I think of it as. But these things hang down, and you have to go a little bit higher. And I don't pex them anymore. I used to try to pex them if they were small, where they empty into the esophagus. Always get into a problem. They always come back. So I resect these with either uh, open uh, with a stapler or with fine suture. So, uh, but normally what I see nowadays is failed procedures from general surgeons or from ENT doctors that said, okay, I need you to help me out with this thing. And it's a mess going in there redo. But uh, zinkers are, are pretty, pretty common. This is an epiphrenic diverticulum. This is not a hiatal hernia. This is also a, <clears throat> can be a, a traction diverticulum, treated thoracoscopically with an endoscopic, with a stapler uh, rather quickly. This is a mid esophageal. See all the matter in the esophagus. This is a dilated esophagus. Obviously, there's something wrong with the motility here. If you, if you resect these and you don't fix the motility issue, they're going to come back, or they're going to come back on the other side. So once again, manometry is exceedingly important. You check and see where if there's tertiary waves, if there's a hyperactive lower esophageal sphincter, and treat it appropriately with a, either a, a myotomy or some sort of procedure. Botox is very good at the distal esophagus, and resect this thing uh, at a single setting. Uh, endovascular stents, we're seeing more and more esophageal issues from endovascular stents, especially with T-bar. You all know what T-bar is. They're stents that are usually started at the distal, uh, distal to the left subclavian, and these things exert outward pressure. You've seen these things are, are spring-loaded, basically, and it expands into the uh, aorta. Well, the aorta is right abut the esophagus, and some of those little metal tines go through there, create an inflammatory reaction, and you can get an esophagitis. I have taken care of no less than three aortoesophageal fistulas and tons of aortobronchial fistulas, either from aneurysm or aneurysm therapy, from, from things like that. So you're going to be seeing these in your career more and more with T-bar. Single strictures are really not the realm of the uh, general surgeon or the thoracic surgeon unless there's a complication, unless they've been dilated a million times or unless they're perforated. These patients have, uh, may have uh, Skaski's rings from um, reflux esophagitis, Barrett's medication or tablets, radiotherapy, corrosive esophagitis, eosinophilic esophagitis. I've seen a patient with a perforated esophagus because of this. It's a very friable esophagus. It's really an autoimmune issue. But what you'll be asked to see is, um, Dr. Alway, come in here. I've got a, a guy I've been dilating for years. Well, we did, he was bougie and I at home, came in because of a tight stricture, and we dilated him. Now he's got some bubbles in his mediastinum. They're going to ask you, I see this four or five times a year. Or pneumatic dilatation maybe has occurred because of achalasia or something, and they're going to ask you to come evaluate the esophagus. What test do you think is probably the most important test uh, with this study? We, we reviewed this with PERFs a couple of weeks ago. Esophagram. What type? Would you say uh, gastrographin or would you go for a thicker measure? Exactly. If it's negative, proceed. 
you can proceed with that. Now, if the patient's in dire straits and you'll need a quick diagnosis if he's in shock, um, don't just explore them for sure. Go ahead and use a thin barium mixture after if you have a negative esophagram with the, with the water-soluble stuff. The water-soluble stuff sometimes won't get into the, to the leak itself. A CT scan is inherently poor for esophageal perfs, especially in around an esophagus that's got a lot of inflammation. EGD is even worse. So if they call you and you have CT scan with, with a minimum metastatum, proceed with that esophagram. Uh, I think it'll be in your best, uh, best interest. <coughs> These things can be very tough because if you have a perforation with the stricture, what do you do? You want to go in and patch it, obviously, but the stricture's going to stay and get worse, and you're going to have problems on down the line. If they have minimal mediastinal soilage, you can proceed with resection at that time, and that's what most of the literature reacts to uh, with, with these strictures. So strictures, we see the complication of them. We don't normally see, uh, we don't normally, are not there for esophageal resection for these. All right, Barrett's. This is something always on the exam. It's on the thoracic boards. It's on the general surgery boards. Uh, there's millions and millions of people with GE reflux. Well, because of the chronicity of this, one to two percent of patients have some sort of genetic predisposition or they just abuse their bodies so much that this columnar epithelium from the stomach continues to creep up the esophagus. And it is the body's way of protecting it from acid. The problem is it undergoes malignant changes in, in about uh, you know, 20 or 30% of these patients. So you have to follow these. And I'll show you an algorithm in a few minutes that they'll usually ask you about. But it'll proceed rather slowly but surely if, it, if, the, if the acid reflux continues with low-grade dysplasia, high-grade dysplasia, which can harbor cancer in 40%. That's a very important uh, thing to remember. And, in, and gross cancer, which is adenocarcinoma. This is adenocarcinoma, which looks re relatively innocuous in the distal esophagus, uh, but these patients luckily are being uh, followed more and more and are being resected quicker uh, because of uh, surveillance. And here's just a quick algorithm. You get the diagnosis of Barrett's with columnar mucosa from biopsy in the distal esophagus. This is what it looks like. It looks velvety. And you can see it, it looks like something's creeping out of the stomach. It looks like gastric mucosa. It's specialized epithelium, it has metaplasia. If there's no dysplasia, you just repeat the endoscopy once or twice a year, biopsy six or seven areas, uh, and if it's negative, endoscopy every three years. If they have low-grade dysplasia, it shows that it's propagating into more malignant process. So you can you repeat the endoscopy in six months, have uh, one or two pathologists confirm it's low-grade once a year after that. Some people will ablate that with endoscopic methods. Um, that's very controversial when you're trying to when you try, try to start doing it. High-grade dysplasia has to be taken care of, either endoscopically with ablative techniques or with esophagectomy. Because if you do not, 40% of those will harbor adenocarcinoma. Uh, now, where, where does reflux surgery fit into this? Well, reflux surgery has been shown, if it's done correctly, there's a lot of people that do good reflux operations and there's a lot of people who do bad reflux operations. If that reflux is correctly fixed with a Nissen, a, a door, or, or some sort of procedure like that, you'll actually get regression of Barrett's in about 60 or 70% of the cases. So they're on high dose H2 blockers, they get a, they get a wrap, next thing you know, Barrett's goes away. So I think Barrett's to me is, is an indication for if it has no dysplasia or low grade dysplasia, proceed with uh, this reflux and you'll see regression of this. But if you give it to somebody who does one or two of these a year, it's, it can make them worse. They'll get gas bloat, they'll still have reflux and it, the situation's even worse than that. So this is just a busy slide that shows why are we seeing so much Barrett's? Because we're seeing more obesity. When you see more obesity, you see more intrathoracic stomach. When you see more reflux, you see more damage. So this is something, if you look at the curve of the obesity epidemic in the United States, Barrett's almost parallels that in its entirety. So this is something that's brought on by affluency. It's not brought on by uh, patients that are, you know, drinking every day, smoking every day. This is people that just have really let their self go and they continue to have reflux. It's a very affluent disease. Just, I've, I've taken care of, I don't know how many people in their 50s and 60s that had absolutely no symptoms other than a little dysphagia underwent that and they had frank adenocarcinoma from this Barrett's. Okay, we're gonna move on to carcinoma now. Uh, we're gonna move on. Was it 7.30 I have till? Okay. Esophageal carcinoma is now creeping up the scale for esophageal, or excuse me, for carcinoma uh, type of diseases in, in the body, once again because of the GE junction. 
cancer, squamous, squamous cell used to be, even in the beginning of my career, squamous cell was the most common cancer in the esophagus. It was always in the mid-esophagus. It was people who weren't affluent, people who had tuberculosis, people who smoked and drank, and basically were institutionalized or kind of, you know, drunks, basically, but they, they did a lot of smoking. So squamous cell slowly continued its current route, but then all of a sudden we started seeing adenocarcinomas coming up in the distal esophagus uh, in the more affluent population, and it has a lot to do with what we've done to ourselves. So it's now 60 to 70 percent of those patients with uh, frank esophageal cancer. It almost always presents greater than stage two, which means it's gone through the wall, and it's about to enter the uh, nodes. Most people present with difficulty swallowing, and some have high-grade dysplasia in Barrett's like we just discussed. Now, the one good thing is, is we're, while we're not screening like Japan does, Japan screens and they catch more grade one esophageal cancers than anyone. It's amazing how many they get, and you see their literature, and you really can't compare it to the United States literature. They had 60% stage ones. We have 20% stage ones. So their results obviously are better, and they're very aggressive early on. They have minimally, minimally invasive techniques. They have small hands, so they can do the transiatals. They can get their hands in there, and they're small people. So uh, the transiatals with them are very, uh, very much, much easier. And once again, esophageal carcinoma is more and more associated with affluency uh, than it used to be. Epidemiologically, it's the seventh leading cause of cancer deaths. It's almost as malignant and bad as, uh, as pancreatic cancer. It counts for 1% of all malignancies, but we do hear a lot about it. Uh, it's more common in areas where there's a lot of smoking and they have some strange cultural uh, deals with uh, salted meat, things like that, that, that truly brings out uh, nitrosamines in uh, some of these foodstuffs. <clears throat> it increases with age, obviously, as our T-suppressor system becomes a little less active and it peaks in the sixth to seventh decade. Males <clears throat> much more affected than females, and African Americans more than the white population. Risk factors, squamous cell, we talked a few minutes ago, smoking and drinking, drinking very hot liquids. There's some cultures, especially in India, that like their their, their drinks over 165 degrees Fahrenheit. That's going to damage the esophagus. So in the morning when you're drinking your coffee, put a little cool half and half. Maybe help your esophagus. That's what I do anyway. I, I love drinking hot things, but you know it may help. So, uh, achalasia is more associated with squame, caustic injury, thoracic irradiation. HPV is very interesting that on both ends of the GI tract, the perirectal region in the rectum and also the proximal distal esophagus, you're seeing cancers associated with HPV, thus the move to, per, to proceed with uh, uh, the vaccines in younger people. Adenocarcinoma, once again, is a reflux disease. Um, surprisingly enough, Helicobacter pylori, because of the inflammation, potentially uh, protects us from this because uh, our, our, our stomach is producing more T cells. It may fight locally the cancer. Um, not a reason to get it, but nonetheless, finding. <clears throat> this, is, this slide is basically just to show the workup for esophageal cancer. Someone who comes to you is usually already worked up uh, by the gastroenterologist, but they will ask you in your exams, what would you use to stage an esophageal cancer? They're almost always found from barium esophagography and EGD. EGD is not on here, but obviously that's a very important part of this workup. Contrast CT can show exactly you know, what, where, where it's located in the esophagus. PET scan can show positive nodes in the area, especially those in the abdomen, the uh, celiac and uh, hepatic nodes. That'll help us with making the diagnosis and staging early. And also uh, endoscopic ultrasound, which we showed you just a few minutes ago. This is the barium esophagram tapering. Now, how could you tell this from, say, achalasia? Well, it's difficult. You'd have to follow this up with the scope. But a ragged edge of anything, whether it's in the lung, whether it's in the colon, this, this uh, apple core looking lesion is, is cancer until proven otherwise. This of course is your worst nightmare. And you come in with a little dysphagia, they do an esophageal ultrasound. This is a hyper echoic in the middle. Remember that lyomyoma was kind of clear. This shows some substrate here and it's very ragged on the edges. And this is what they found during your scope. More and more and more of these are being found in, at the lower, lower GE junction. Barrett's metaplasia in, along with esophageal adenocarcinoma. And these probably grew out of one another. Someone who probably didn't listen to their symptoms. And this is, I think this is very important. Very much like the colon, when you're looking at the classification of colon cancer and the staging, you have to know 
uh, that the esophagus is a little different than other uh, GI conduits. So you need to know this to help with the staging. I hate staging because there's so many cancers and you've got to learn all these stagings before the test, but unfortunately it is what it is and you've got to learn it. So the epithelium, the basement membrane, the lamina propria really protects, if you can catch it in this stage here, which like I said the Chinese and, and the Japanese do quite well, uh, and preventing it from going past the muscularis mucosa into the submucosa and, and the last uh, level of defense for early stage cancers is this muscularis propria. Once it gets into the parasophageal tissues, remember, remember there's no serosa like it is in the colon, it goes everywhere. So it's fairly, it's fairly um, <clears throat> stage oriented. In other words, it goes rather pre predictably from the mucosa into the parasophageal tissues and in the nodes. It's not like a sarcoma that goes into the blood and you get distant metastasis. So esophageal cancer is a slow grower, but nonetheless it's very predictable if you can catch it early. Here's that dreaded TNM classification. It's you almost need two cups of coffee to go through. But basically there's four T stages and has is a microscopic diagnosis. High grade dysplasia is usually those that are found with Barrett's that, that have uh, minimal uh, changes in the, the deep layers. And then you have invasions of these, these layers here, the lamina propria, muscularis, and the submucosa. When you get past this invasion of the muscularis propria and you get into T3, that's when the problems start. Uh, these up here, uh, T, uh, the TIS can be treated with endoscopic, basically what they do is eviscerate the mucosa. They grab it at the stomach and they pull the esophagus inside out. So they take all the, all the esophageal mucosa out. What you have is basically a denuded esophagus that's to regrow its mucosa. It's a pretty violent procedure. It's much worse than I think what we do, but it's a nucleation of the, uh, the inside of the esophagus. Does it obliterate it? Absolutely. Uh, is it painful? Patients say it's one of the worst things that they've ever had done. And it regrows the mucosa. So it, it's an it's a accepted therapy now for high-grade dysplasia. Nodal status, uh, very similar to other cancers in the GI tract. They, no, the nodal status has to do with the number of positive nodes. Most patients present, once again, with a T3, 4, or 4B, and with usually uh, one to two nodes, maybe even more. So these patients present with stage three disease. Very difficult for the surgeons to do anything about that early on. This is, I think this is the best microscopic slide from the American Cancer Society and some university hospitals that shows <clears throat> the microscopic progression of esophageal cancer. TIS, Barrett's, intramucosal, once again, very treatable. Uh, with uh, most people would just use esophagectomy in these early T stages without neoadjuvant therapy. Neoadjuvant therapy is treatment with radiation and chemo, or radiation or chemo, prior to surgical therapy. So neoadjuvant means before, adjuvant therapy means after. So neoadjuvant therapy can cure you at this stage, excuse me, at this stage here. Surgery only is indicated in, in these regions. Endoablative therapies here. So I don't want to confuse you with that. Endoscopic uh, techniques with TIS, one and two, really are better treated with no chemo radiation and just esophagectomy, uh, especially if your screening tests show no uh, in large lymph nodes by PET scan or by CT scan. And once you get to T2, T3, T4, the literature thinks that neoadjuvant therapy is better. And I've seen patients that have come in uh, with this region that I've done preoperative, pretty tough chemo, radiation therapy. I take the esophagus out and there's no tumor in the specimen, an RO uh, type of therapy. Now that's great, it makes you feel good, Hey, guess what? We took it out, there's nothing left in the specimen. Well, why'd you take it out? <laughs> well, we don't know that. And some of these patients come back with metastasis later on, so it's not a not 100%. Any questions about the staging system? Okay, let's go over esophagectomy. We've got, may have some time for some questions after this. Um, there's basically two types of esophageal resections, and everybody thinks theirs is the best. Uh, esophagus is a hard, organ to get to. The good Lord put it in the posterior mediastinum. It's just like the pancreas. It's back in the heart of the body. It's very difficult to get out. It's around a bunch of vital structures. And it's friable. So you have to, you have to use good surgical techniques. I've been doing esophagectomies for 20 years. I can't do a good Ivor Lewis with um, lymph node dissection and a good two-stage hand sewn anastomosis inside four hours. I'm pretty quick. But, but you've got to take, pay attention to detail. Little things like tearing the splenic capsule off, 
sounds like a no big dealer. Problem is if you have to give them blood, you increase their risk of recurrence. So if you really want to take care of your patients, do this slow, don't have another case on afterwards, and to make sure they're nutritionally acceptable and ready, and let them know what a big procedure this is. <clears throat> Transiatal, most of these procedures were uh, invented in the late 40s. Uh, and the transiatal actually was done in, in the early 50s and, and had a resurgence by Mark Oranger from the University of Michigan, <coughs> who I know well, and he's got a number six and a half hands. And he writes in his literature that, yeah, anybody over eight, don't even try this operation. So if you have 10 smooth hands, it'd be nice, or get your assistant who can do that. Uh, but the Ivor Lewis is more open. I think an Ivor Lewis is a better cancer operation. This is much more minimally invasive, but you'll hear people on both sides. There have never been any back-to-back -back studies that compared T2, T3, or stage two or three esophageal cancer with this. It just won't happen. So you have to use what you think is best and how you can best treat your patients. The McCune is a three incision, so basically it's a upper midline laparotomy, right thoracotomy, and a cervical incision. The Ivor Lewis is an upper midline laparotomy and a right thoracotomy with no cervical incision. Uh, and thoracoscopics, they can, if you can do that, God help you, you do it. It's tough. <laughs> I did a couple of these. They lasted about seven hours. And these patients are normally depleted nutritionally and may not be the best candidates. So uh, some of these centers are doing this. But actually, if you look at thoracoscopic esophagectomy, the, the incidence is going down, not up which leads me to believe there's a lot of people out there that are having difficult times getting good resection margins. Okay, let's go with Ivor Lewis. This is important because, it, you know, these procedures are complementary. They're not really uh, competitive. It's better for bulky mid-esophageal lesions uh, anywhere inside the uh, lower than the uh, uh, azagous vein. If it's azagous vein and above, uh, you may need a McCune to try to get that a three incision. It's a two field lymphadenectomy. You take the lymph nodes out of the, out of the uh, celiac axis, some out of the, around the port of hepatis, and in the chest. So you, get, you can get 20 nodes, 20 nodes with this operation. It's two incisions. Uh, I do is those people who do pyloric drainage and some who don't, and those who don't usually come back over here when they get two or three patients that have gastric outlet obstruction because you're taking the vagus nerve out. You're hammering the stomach. Is it going to empty appropriately? No. And the last thing you need is an esophagectomy patient with, two, with an anastomosis not to empty that stomach. It's miserable. You have two or three of these patients, you say, I'm always going to do it from now on. I do a Heineke Michelitz. It's an old fashioned. I'll show you. You can basically open the stomach, put a dilator through it, and tear it. Or you can use Botox, which I think next time I'm going to try this. Uh, the literature is pretty good. Uh, and they can do it endoscopically later on down the line. I mean, it'll prevent you and save you roughly about 30 minutes <clears throat> on having to do a hands-on anastomosis to drain the stomach, because the stomach's just going to lay there. It's a passive conduit once you do a esophagectomy. You have to maintain the right gastroepiploic. <clears throat> if, you, if you ligate this, uh, you're going to lose your conduit. And anybody that's been esophageal surgery with me, I'm always feeling for that right gastroepiploic. So I stay off that greater curve, especially around the gastroduodenal, because if you get into that, if you get into some bleeding, you just throw some stitches in, you're going to ligate it. And the conduit may look good early. You get it up there about six days out, it just falls apart. Then you're looking at the colon interposition. So watch your right gastroepiploic. You ligate the left, gast the left gastric artery. And make sure when you tie these epiploics on the, less, on the greater curve up near the spleen, give it a little uh, distance because you can get gastric uh, gangrene also from tying these stitches too close to the stomach. As you pull the uh, stomach up through, and this is a gastric conduit, we basically take the esophagus out and use the stomach as a conduit to reestablish uh, continuity. <clears throat> if you turn that stomach, and it's easy to do, especially if you've already got the belly closed and you're pulling up through the chest, if you turn it, you're going to have some issues also with gastric outlet uh, problems. A fun operation. Uh, you do it up upper midline. You don't have to go below the umbilicus unless it's a morbidly obese patient. You can get the nodes around the the upper esophagus or mid-esophagus and around the uh, celiac. I said hepatic, take that out of your screen. You do not use, do any hepatic. Uh, it's mostly just the celiac and the paraesophageal nodes in the chest. First thing you do, and I, I don't do it this way, I take the gastrocolic ligament down first because I like to get into the lesser sac and be able to move the stomach back and forth. But the literature shows that most people start in the gastropatic ligament up near the liver, not near the lesser curve. 
so you can take the lymph nodes. You got to watch for the accessory hepatic. If you ever replaced a, a, pa a paddock over there and you get into it, just like any time you're in the lesser sac, you're going to get in trouble. So you take the frontoesophageal ligament down. Uh, this looks beautiful here. The left lobe of the liver is in, in your way. You have to retract that up. Get around this. I usually get it around it with some electrocautery and my finger, two fingers around there, and put a large penrose drain to pull that esophagus up. Next thing you know, after you have that down, I've already taken the gastrohepatic ligament and great care in the right gastroepiploic. I start looking in the back. There's always adhesions, especially if you've had neoadjuvant therapy. There's adhesions between the back of the stomach and the, and the pancreas. You've got to be very careful. And the left gastric is back there also. So um, you're going to be flap, flopping the stomach left and right. Y'all been in the left upper quadrant before? You know how difficult it is to take some of these short gastrics down, especially in a big patient. I think it's better done uh, endoscopically, but you know I, I don't do this as an endoscopic operation. So getting around the spleen gives me as much an, you know, angst and animosity as, as the uh, transverse arch. So take these down carefully. I still tie these. I don't put clips because if you put clips, uh, you're going to pull that esophag or that new stomach up through the hiatus. Those things are going to pop off, and you're going to have thoracic bleeding. Worse than that, you're going to have bleeding below the diaphragm after your belly's been closed. So since this is a two incision therapy. You close the abdominal incision, you're up in the chest. If you have clips on those short gastrics, if you pull it up through the hiatus, they're going to get, they're going to pop off. Now, <clears throat> I don't have any with the harmonic scalpel. Some of y'all use a harmonic scalpel on some of these. Some people uh, love that. I just tie them. I got to sleep at night. All right. And once again, watch your right gastroepiploic. Uh, some people take a huge amount of momentum with that because they think it's cancer curing. Well, if you have a huge amount of momentum along with that new gastric conduit, bringing it up through the hiatus is going to be problematic and you're going to have to make a bigger hole in your uh, diaphragm. So I think uh, moderation is a little better than just uh, a huge amount of fat. Short gastrics are divided. Splenic tears to me are one of the biggest complications with this procedure as is any gastric mobilization. You have to have that stomach uh, with the ability to reach here, at the top of the chest or the cricoid. You have to mobilize the stomach. And you can do that by taking down short gastrics, taking down the gastrocolic and the gastrohepatic ligaments. You have to do a very generous coker maneuver, which means getting that areolar tissue in the uh, right upper quadrant, right where the colon and the gallbladder and the transverse colon and the duodenum meet. You go down and find the duodenum. And a lot of times, you have, all you have to do is a little electrocautery or some METs Pull that duodenum immediately until you see the IVC. I look at the, I want to see the inferior vena cava, and I know I've done an adequate coker maneuver. And it also makes your gastric drainage procedure much easier if you have the duodenum and the pylorus right there. It's the same as ever. So once again, you take out the short gastrics, you take out the left gastroepiploic, you keep the right gastroepiploic, and you ligate the left gastric. So basically, you have the right gastroepiploic uh, given the entire blood supply to this new gastric conduit. So if you, if you hammer this, the conduit's dead. So you've got to be very careful. This just shows an intraoperative. I use the upper hand retractor. This is uh, something around your new gastric conduit. This is in the le lesser sac here. They have it taken down the entirety of their gastrocolic ligament, which they'll do. And you can get the stomach way up to the chest. It's very nice. If you do not get adequate mobilization, you're going to have problems. Because this is an anastomosis you absolutely cannot like we talked about a couple of months, a couple of weeks ago, you cannot have, uh, it can't be tight. If this, if this is tight, you're gonna, it's going to leak. I don't, have, I don't care how many layers you put in. Mostly, the ones I deal with, I take the entire esophagus out, as much esophagus as possible, because the esophagus is disease. There can be multi, multifocal squam or adenocarcinoma in the specimen. It shows the pyelomyotomy. I also put in every one. I'm not sure if Dr. Chu does, but I put a, a JG Nostomy in all of these patients. I think it's much needed and you can pull it out when you don't need it. Now, most of these patients are NPO for at least 10 days, even if you, even if you have a perfect uh, esophageal anastomosis and there's no evidence of leak. Pyloromyotomy, old fashioned, you, you open it transversely through the pylorus and you close it vertically. And it basically makes it a patchless, non-functional pylorus where it'll empty. It's a gastric emptying procedure. This is in the chest, hard to tell from the slide. But you pull up your conduit through the hiatus that you've made. Um, and then you take the esophagus out. Usually I use a GIA also with there. And you can kind of cut the lesser curve out. You get any adenocarcinoma. And you make the stomach into a tube. 
So you straighten the stomach out. And remember, the stomach is a passive conduit from here on. Those patients need to sit up when they eat. Uh, they, they'll regurgitate and aspirate if you don't, especially early postoperatively. Here's the proposed suture line. It looks almost exactly the way I do it. And you have a, a basically a, a new conduit. Now, this is the area that's prone to ischemia. It's the farthest away. There's staples there. So do your best to maintain that blood flow. I use a two-layer sonar anastomosis. Some people will make a gastrotomy and stick a stapler there. I have seen EEAs and staplers leak a lot more than hands-on anastomosis now. You look at the literature, it's about the same. It's much easier throwing staples through there, but I, 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 I use a technique such as this. Posterior limbrates with silks interrupted, about seven or eight of them. Cut the stomach uh, right there. Make sure it's good bleeding tissue. You can tell if you've got a good conduit because it bleeds like stink as soon as you open this up. Then a running 4-0 on a RB1 needle, a Vicryl, and I run it all the way around and then another layer of limbrates. And Make sure it's loose. If it's tight, try to free something up. And I also put the stomach, I take the stomach and I sew it to the prevertebral fascia, which will take away some of your tension. Get you some interrupted, uh, non-absorbable, stick it to the prevertebral fascia, it'll tack the stomach up and lay your stomach right on, your esophagus right on top of it. Ivor Lewis uh, complications leak, obviously, about uh, anywhere from 2 to 8%. Gastric ischemia, usually from torsion or inadequate uh, Preservation of your blood supply, gastric outlet syndrome, respiratory, since you do a thoracotomy, hiatal hernia, uh, and I mean by that is that you made your hiatus too big and you have colon and other intra-abdominal organs uh, creeping up into your chest. Chylothorax can happen lower than the transhiatal. The chylothorax usually occurs at the diaphragm here. The Ivor Lewis chylothorax occurs in the left hemithorax because you're higher up and you usually don't violate, you violate it higher up in the neck. This is what a chest x-ray looks like in somebody who had an Ivor Lewis. This is the stomach inter, interthoracically. They have gastric outlet syndrome. This person did not do a, a pyloric uh, drainage or stomach draining, and, and basically you have gastric outlet obstruction. It's a miserable way to live. Transital, uh, also called the Oranger. Uh, University of Michigan has done more of these than anyone. It's a two incision, upper midline laparotomy, left neck incision. You can only take one field of lymph nodes out, and it's usually in the upper, upper GI. The mobilization is exactly the same as the Ivor Lewis in the stomach. It's just that you um, grunge up through the posterior mediastinum with both your hands. Now, <clears throat> some surgeons have this down to where they can, uh, they can actually get it to where they have just about this much space between their two hands, and it's an art. Have y'all been there? The cervical esophagus is very difficult to get down into. You have to watch the recurrent laryngeal nerve. A horse patient after this operation is an unhappy patient. Hoarseness, and Orger says all the time when he lectures about this, if you get hoarseness, these patients are going to be unhappy. Uh, so you've got to watch the recurrent laryngeal nerve. You're right there. So trying to get the sponge stick on top of the esophagus and around the esophagus through the thoracic inlet can be very challenging. Uh, and, and likewise, in the posterior mediastinum, you have to go up behind the heart anterior to the aorta to try to get a lot of these, uh, these little bleeders that are going to be there, especially the azagous vein. So you're always going to have about this much, and guess what's there? Azagous vein, membranous portion of the trachea, membranous portion of the left main stem, uh, and, and that's that what's going to get you. That's what's gotten me in the past. So you just inching, 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 uh, everything's fine and not until all of a sudden anesthesiologist says, I've lost my airway pressure and you see subcutaneous, you see emphysema all in your posterior mediastinum. What does that mean? Yeah. It's bad. If you don't have a double lumen tube in, how are you going to do that? You're going to have, you're going to lose, you're going to be blowing air out your posterior mediastinum. You have to, which, which would be the approach to go to to fix this airway? Left thoracotomy, right thoracotomy, sternotomy? If you have an airway issue during this operation, right thoracotomy, you have to do it quick because you're going to lose your airway. You can, you can repair it. It can be repaired. It's usually a small tear, but it's pretty, pretty doggone impressive if, with air blowing out of your incision and you know what you did. Uh, so that's one of the complications. Now, I'm not saying it's not a good operation. It definitely is, but you do not take lymph nodes in the thoracic cavity. You just take them in the abdominal cavity. This is a diagrammatic view of this, the old trusty sponge stick, as low as you can get it and hope that you don't get into some of these structures. This is from the inferior aspect. You have about three or four centimeters of stomach left. 
in, in a nice anastomosis, you don't have empyema, you may have a fistula up here in the neck, but it's better tolerated than a leak in the chest, obviously. Once again, this is a two-homes, two uh, two-layer sewn anastomosis. I do not put a pleural flap in. If you do a good anastomosis, you don't need that. Um, they keep their NG tube in still five or six days with me. Complications of transhiatal, pneumothorax. You can get into the pleural spaces, especially in people with COPD. Bleeding from the aortic branches, there's tons of those little things that usually plot off, they do. Uh, the azicus vein, you do not want to get into that, and it's right anterior lateral and to the left of your esophagus. Recurrent laryngeal nerve injury, we just talked about the calothorax and posterior membranous airway injury. Cervical tumors are bad. I've never operated on one. Uh, these patients usually have local regional disease. They're usually stage three and four. Uh, if it's above the carina, it's usually an ENT issue. They get a, a commando procedure. If it's lower than that, uh, occasionally we're asked to see these patients, but once again, these patients are usually in, in dire, I've never operated on one. You go to MD Anderson, you talk to their surgeons, they operate on one out of 10 cervical esophageal cancer patients. Okay, once again, uh, stage three, 10% survival, stage two, 35% survival, stage one, which presents about 10 or 15% of the United States population, is 80%, surprisingly. It's almost always those patients that I have long-term survivors that had cancer found in Barrett's. It's early, there's no nodes, and you can do something that's not quite as invasive. And I think the, the Arbor Lewis is better here. That's when you don't necessarily need to have lymph nodes. If it's a, if it's a T1 lesion, and there appears to be no adenopathy on the PET or the CT, Arbor Lewis is perfect for that. It's not stuck down. You take the entire esophagus out and you have a cervical anastomosis. So I think the, uh, did I say Arbor Lewis? I meant transhiatal would be better. If I, if I said that, I apologize. Management, uh, <clears throat> early lesions, you get just esophagectomy. Remember that the mid-stage lesions should get neoadjuvant therapy and advanced lesions do not need surgery. Nowadays they can get stents. Esophageal, uh, uh, palliative esophageal resection is almost unheard of now. So if it comes up on your test, say no. Stent, chemo radiation therapy is better for the patient. Mid stages, I think Ivor Lewis is better with a good 20, 30 lymph node exoneration of the posterior mediastinum and with chemo and radiation. Still, it's a horrible disease to have. All right, and this is what people get. Uh, it's amazing. There's, there's, there's so many SWOG protocols, so many uh, chemotherapy protocols that a lot of these uh, are kind of up in grabs, and there's still studies going on, especially at MD Anderson, for do you do preoperative neoadjuvant chemo radiation for all esophageal cancers, or do you not? And that's the big question. But just remember, esophagectomy early on with early disease gets better results. Neoadjuvant therapy for the stage twos and threes. And that's it.